Hi there, Simple Families, Danae here. I'm checking in for the second week of June, 2022. This week in the Simple Families community, we are chatting all about summer, making plans for our book club, and I'm prepping our monthly group learning session, which for this month is all about handling when kids talk back. I think something that most of us are familiar with. I'd love to have you join in so I can get to know you better. And you can bring all your questions to our live monthly office hours. It's only $10 a month. Go to simplefamilies.com forward slash community. How would the stepsisters tell the story of Cinderella? Very differently than Cinderella's perspective, right? So if we start allowing our kids to recognize that there are many ways to represent information and storytelling, we've already given them the first chink in the armor of that black and white thinking without expecting them to not be black and white. The goal isn't for them to be gray or anyone to be gray. It is to recognize that each person's viewpoint is as sacred to that person as is your own. So when I define critical thinking then, I start with the idea that you flip the camera lens around and you do almost an academic selfie. And you ask yourself, what are the factors that are influencing how I think about this topic. Hi, this is Danae. I'm the founder of Simple Families. Simple Families is an online community for parents who are seeking a simpler, more intentional life. In this show, we focus on minimalism with kids, positive parenting, family wellness, and decreasing the mental load. My perspectives are based in my firsthand experience raising kids, but also rooted in my PhD in child development. So you're going to hear conversations that are based in research, but more importantly, real life. Thanks for joining us. We all need this conversation today, no matter your age, no matter where you are in the world. We can all do better at seeing the perspective of others and understanding other humans have different life experiences that change their viewpoints. The voice you heard in the intro is Julie Bogart. She's the author of the brand new book, Raising Critical Thinkers. And it's not just for kids. Every adult listening is going to take away some valuable information. Julie is known for her common sense parenting and education advice. She's also the author of the beloved book, The Brave Learner. She's the creator of the award-winning innovative online writing program called Brave Writer that's now been around for 22 years. And she home educated her five children. Julie brings so much grace and perspective to this topic, which is much needed in the world we're living in today. Before we get into today's episode, here's a one-minute word from our sponsor. I'd like to thank PrepDish for sponsoring today's podcast. PrepDish has been an integral part of my family for many years now. It's a meal planning service. It's as simple as a PDF that lands in my inbox each week that tells me what I'm going to be making for the week to come. Because I like things simple, I always choose the super fast menu, which is indeed super fast to prepare for. It usually involves spending about 30 minutes to an hour with my partner prepping on a Sunday. And that allows us to get the meals on the table within a matter of minutes during the week. Prep Dish has lightened my load exponentially. I used to spend far too long browsing recipes on Pinterest, flipping through cookbooks, and then just giving up because I was swimming in decision fatigue. But Prep Dish has changed all that. If you want to give it a try, go to preptish.com forward slash families, and you can try two weeks free. Without further ado, here's my chat with Julie. Hi, Julie. How are you? I'm so good, Danae. Thank you for having me. Well, I am happy to have you here. I have been a fan of your work for a long time. That is lovely to hear. So we sort of had a brief... um, escapade, maybe you could call it, into homeschooling um, a few years ago. And I I found your work in that community. But I love that this new book, I feel like you you kind of started in the homeschool world and now you're branching out and bringing so much more to so many more of us. Yeah, that really was the goal. I felt like we need this uh, kind of educational experience to happen in families. 
And it doesn't matter whether your kids are in school or not. You can foster an environment of critical thinking just at the dinner table, in the car, when you put them to bed at night. It really is the key, in my view, to reversing this current crazy effect we have happening of polarization in our culture. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what you do and how you got where you are today. Yeah. So I own a company called Brave Writer. I started it in January of 2000, back in the old days when the internet was new and exciting. And I thought it was going to be the utopia that solved all of our problems. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But I'm a professional freelance writer and I was a magazine editor and a ghost writer. And so I noticed as I was home educating my own five children that there was really a dearth of writing materials that capitalized on what professional writers knew about writing. So a lot of the writing materials I encountered were designed for a school experience. And that experience, honestly, has not produced generations of confident adult writers. Mm -hmm. Like most adults, when I talk to them, feel a little nervous about submitting their writing, even online for social media, let alone a more official context. And it's because, in my view, the way that we treat writing is such a zero-sum activity focused a lot on mechanics, and we have not capitalized on the original ideas, thoughts, and insights of a human being. So I produced materials and online classes that have been very successful in the homeschool space and have spilled over into the non-homeschooling world as well. And during the pandemic, of course, there was such a surge in home education. Brave Rider became much more well-known, and um, we continue to have families whose kids are not homeschooled use our stuff. Oh, that's so great. So this new book you have, Raising Critical Thinkers, I was hoping that you could start with just telling us a little bit about how the acquisition of knowledge has changed just in your lifespan. Wow, what a great way to begin. So as a child in the 1960s and 70s, I was raised in Southern California. And actually, I had quite an innovative public school experience. My teachers, many of them had been among the first Peace Corps volunteers. They came back very idealistic and excited to experiment with various methods of learning. But that said, even with all the immersive stuff that we did, we were limited to libraries and network television and daily newspapers. There was a flow of information that was somewhat manageable for the scale of being human. By the time my kids were being raised, about midway through the 90s, my oldest child was, you know, around 10, uh, suddenly this new form of information was unleashed on the world, the internet, the World Wide Web. And now there's no one sort of teasing apart that information for us or sort of deciding what we get to listen to or read or learn. There is this undifferentiated mass of communication and we don't know how to filter it. So even though schools still rely on teachers and textbooks and methods of testing, students can circumvent all that and go do their own reading, their own research. They can be invited into spaces that they would never learn about otherwise. It creates both opportunity and limitation. So the opportunity is you get to eavesdrop on conversations that you would never understand Mm -hmm. otherwise. I remember when blogging first began, I was a blogger blogger, and uh, they had a little next button, and you could click it, and it would take you to new blogs. And I remember, uh, just for the sake of your audience knowing, I'm a white woman, and I grew up in Southern California. I was raised Catholic, and so I did not have a lot of experience with the Midwest or other big cities, and I remember stumbling on this blog that was hosted by a black educator in the south side of Chicago. And the entire conversation was among other teachers who lived there. And the debate was whether or not they should feel comfortable moving to the suburbs. They were literally debating among themselves whether they would be betraying their communities or not to leave. And I remember what really stood out to me at the time was that I would never have had any opportunity to hear this conversation apart from the Mm -hmm. internet. It gave me a window of insight into struggles, identity issues, uh, aspirations of a group of people I didn't know. And that's the true value of the internet. 
Obviously, yeah. the dark side is that you are also able to self-select like-minded people. You can be introduced to unvetted information that's being passed along by people you trust and assume that it is accurate. And there is a glut of information. So there's a kind of skepticism or cynicism in like my adult children that I didn't have because they've had to sort through all this with very young minds. Whereas for mm -hmm. me, I was a full grown adult when the internet began. So I see the way we get information today as requiring so much more of us. And it's exhausting. It's it's yeah. exhausting to vet all that information. It's funny. The it's requiring more of us in different ways, right? Because it required more of our physical energy to go to the library and look <laughs> yes. up the book and learn the Dewey Decimal System. But now it's taking more mental energy yes. to sift through it. I think so. And the yeah. other problem with old library format is that it really depended on where you lived and what mm -hmm. quality the library was. Whereas today the internet has a much more sort of democratic feel in that sense. And you can get access to all kinds of things that you couldn't have gotten access to back when I was, I mean, every now and then when I'm talking to peers in my group, I'm 60 years old, we're like, how did we live before the internet? Like, it's <laughs> almost hard to remember yeah, that you absolutely. could drive somewhere with an, a physical map. How in the world did we manage? Mm -hmm. We can barely manage a phone and drive. So how were we driving with a physical map? Well, we were pulling over. We were examining the map in, you know, a parking lot. So yes, the pace of consumption has mm -hmm. really changed how we learn. Yeah. And it's interesting that you use that example of the conversation that you were kind of lurking on the with the Black educators, because I feel like that 10 years ago, yes, I encountered more of that kind of things yes. I wasn't looking for. But now with the algorithms, I feel like Ugh. it's kind of the reverse, right? I'm being like more and more shifted towards the things that I sort of this confirmation bias, the things I already want to hear about, the things I know about, the things I like. And my world feels like it's getting smaller as a result of that. I completely agree. In fact, I think one of the biggest, um, uh, the biggest mistakes in technology was adding algorithms to Twitter. Twitter, when we first joined it, was a chronological feed of people mm -hmm. you followed. There was no one being suggested to you. You literally had to work to increase your community by branching out, following somebody's tweet, getting to know them. And it was offered to you as those tweets came out. Instagram used to be that way as well. With the advent of promotion, promotion of tweets, promotion of Facebook, promotion of Instagram, we now have to trust these other experts to decide what we should and shouldn't read, how frequently we read it. And you're right. If we have shown ourselves to align with a viewpoint, they're going to keep... I've heard it goes both ways. They'll either keep showing you what you align with, or they will provoke you by showing mm -hmm. you things that keep you angry so that you will stay on their social mm -hmm. media platforms. And that is making it tricky to raise critical thinking kids because yeah. small children cannot make those judgment calls. You know, a 10 year old's going to have a really difficult time being able to recognize that this tweet is being promoted or this, you know, post is being promoted. And I've watched it with my own children. I watched the internet change over the course of their young lives. And it's it's challenging to navigate, but I, I try to offer a few handholds in my book. Yeah. When you were writing this book, did you kind of secretly in the back of your mind hope that the adults were going to be listening in too? To these oh, hundred <laughs> percent. Oh my goodness. So when I was like the grownups need this more than the kids, maybe. <laughs> well, honestly, so the book is written almost like at two levels, like two audiences. So mm -hmm. I really knew that you can't raise a critical thinker without understanding right. what it is to be one. And maybe yeah. that's a good place to start. Critical thinking, most of us associate with examining someone else's ideas. So we see someone over there and we're like, I can identify all the weaknesses in that person's argument. I can notice their bias kicking in. And so then we feel really proud. Uh, I was telling you before we started, I've been introduced, uh, interviewed by a lot of male podcasters. And to a person, they all start by saying they think they're great critical thinkers in the same way they think they're great drivers, right? <laughs> There's, and, and it makes sense to me because when you live in a body and you receive information through your senses and your mind, there is a logical coherence to the beliefs you choose for yourself that no one else on the whole planet has mm -hmm. privy access to because there are experiences, viewpoints, things you've seen and not seen that invisibly shape 
how you build your worldview. So even the most heinous worldview, like let's just take a murderer, for example, they actually feel justified when they commit that act because the way their logic has worked is it includes a bunch of factors that makes that seem like the best choice for the most beautiful life they can imagine. So the problem is because we all feel this way on the inside, we have a hard time recognizing our own biases when they kick into gear or the way our own perspectives interfere with expanding our thinking. Yeah. So when I define critical thinking then, I start with the idea that you flip the camera lens around and you do almost an academic selfie. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and you ask yourself, what are the factors that are influencing how I think about this topic? One of the first things I notice for myself um, to identify my own bias as it kicks into gear is a feeling of smugness. Smugness is a red flag for me. If I'm scrolling through Facebook and one of my high school friends posts something I find outrageous, I will feel smug like, what a stupid post. Yeah. <laughs> I know more than that person. But that's the moment when I have to pause and actually recognize that there's something at stake for me that I'm worried about. And I am partly using this as a defense mechanism. And so critical thinking isn't necessarily overturning their belief or mine, but it is getting inside the internal coherence of that belief for the other person and allowing that to coexist with my current perspective, expanding to include more ways of seeing the same issue would be a great way to think about critical thinking. And that is so hard because even oh. as adults with fully developed reasoning skills, it's very hard to hold both positive and negative feelings towards a person at the same time. Oh my goodness. And honestly, sometimes the more you understand about someone's position, the more horrified you get. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always result in empathy, yeah. but it will result in more understanding. One of the things I notice in our current political climate is the only tool that seems to be available to, to everyone is conversion. Mm -hmm. So I've got a position, you don't hold it, I'm going to make you convert to mine. There's very few circumstances where we say, What's at stake for you? Why do you hold that position? Okay, what's at stake for me? Why do I hold this position? What solution can expand to include both of us? What solution takes in more perspectives, not fewer? If we're going to make any advances in our culture, that's essential, but we have no practice doing it. So my book is aimed at parents. So you start practicing at home. <laughs> So your kids will get used to this experience of, oh, we're not just agreeing to disagree. We're not compromising. We're actually taking into account more perspectives than mine as we brainstorm solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. I'm thinking about all the ways in which the political climate has kind of infiltrated every aspect of our lives. And I know, I, I heard you say that you and your dad have differing political views and so many families I feel like have been torn apart over this. Can you just give any yes. insight into families that, that may be feeling that and how you've handled it? Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Every child wants to feel the admiration of a parent and it doesn't go away. I'm 60 years old. I still want my dad's approval, right? He's 85. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I sent him my book. And he actually wrote back, he's the king of hyperbole, so he called it a masterpiece, which <laughs> actually still surprised me because we are so different. And I didn't know if he would read it and read it through, through the lens of his judgment of the way I see the world, but he didn't. And after we were sitting together and talking about my book, he then veered into some political views he had, and he was identifying people that he really doesn't like. And I said, well, dad, here's what just happened. You told me you really enjoyed my book and you agreed with these thinking tools. He's a lawyer, by the way, so very good at thinking. And, um, and I said, let's eliminate personalities from the conversation and let's pick an issue that you think is critical for today and let's discuss it using some of these tools. So he picked free speech and we got into a pretty good conversation about tech companies, free speech, whether or not corporations deserve the right to regulate what happens with their customers, uh, who would make those regulations, how we see the government. Um, and it lasted about 10 minutes 
of really good. And then of course it took a turn because he's invested mm -hmm. in his point of view and he's older than me. And he feels like this is his last chance to get me to see it his way. When I think about families, the best we can do is create room for a person to show up as they are, where they don't feel unwelcome because of disagreement. Doesn't mean you'll ever align. You can set your own guidelines for how you have those conversations. If they get too heated, offer them another piece of pie, <laughs> give their mouths something else to do. <laughs> but during the conversation, if you can prioritize actually trying to picture how the views they hold create a beautiful picture of the world in their minds, you'll get further. Mm. And that's usually where I start now with people. Yeah. So tell me how your view of free speech creates a beautiful picture of America. And then the follow-up question you can ask if you want to, after you've thoroughly listened, not as a gotcha, how does that view also account for? And then fill in the blank. How does it account for me? How does it account for this group? How does it account for this idea? And give them more to address. But your job isn't to convert anyone or even to catch them off guard in, you know, sort of their hypocrisy. We all have hypocrisy. So that can't be the goal of a conversation. I recently interviewed Bumi Laditan. Are you familiar with her work, The Honest Toddler? I have not read it. No, oh, I recognize her amazing. name though. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so she, I, I circled this quote, it feels relevant here. It says, it's taken many years, but I think I finally love you enough to let you be you. Oh. And I just, that, that was really near and dear to my heart because I, it's this as, as parents, you know, as you described with your father, that we feel this need to pass along us. Mm. To quote Andrew Solomon in his book, Far From the Tree, we engage in an act of production, not reproduction. Mm. We don't reproduce ourselves. We produce a child. And that when we do, when we produce, it doesn't look exactly like us. And that takes many years to really wrap our heads and hearts around. We're going to pause for a two-minute word from our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Pear Eyewear. Pear Eyewear lets you change your glasses like you change your clothes. You choose a base frame. I chose a clear base, which I love and I wear on its own. And then you get magnetic top frame combinations to make it easy to switch up your style. I picked one top frame that is a bright blue, one that's black and white, and one that's sunglasses. My kids don't wear glasses, but my eight-year-old is starting to wish that he did because he thinks mine are so cool. They have a lot of fun options for kids. For every pair of glasses purchased, Pear provides glasses and vision care for children around the world. So get glasses as unique as you are, one pair with infinite style, starting at just $60. Go to PearEyewear.com forward slash simple to get 15% off your first purchase. That's 15% off at P-A-I-R Eyewear.com slash simple. Our final sponsor is Faherty. I hate to play favorites, but Faherty is hands down my favorite clothing company right now and also my husband's favorite clothing company right now. The clothes are timeless, high quality, and so, so soft and comfortable. In fact, Faherty is so confident in the quality of their stuff that they have a lifetime guarantee of quality. They'll replace or fix your clothes forever, no matter what. My husband recently bought two of the Movement shirts, which are a lightweight, wrinkle-resistant button-down shirt, and he's been wearing them pretty much every day. And right now, Faherty is giving you all 20% off. So head to faherdybrand.com slash simple and use the code simple at checkout to snag 20% off your new spring staples. That's code simple at Faherty, F-A-H-E-R-T-Y brand.com slash simple for 20% off. Faritybrand.com slash simple. Thanks for supporting our sponsors. Back to my chat with Julie. I think one of the challenges, and I've got grandchildren now, so I'm watching my son and daughter-in-law um, parent their kids. And one of the challenges is that when you give birth or when you adopt a child, you're bringing them into the bosom of your home 
and you've got a couple decades on them. So you've got experience they don't have. And in the early years, they think of you as a hero and they want the benefit of all that experience. And it feels so reciprocal and good. But there's a moment when your kids exit the front door and they enter the home of someone else and they see that there is a logically coherent way to be that is different mm. than yours. That is the beginning of their differentiation from you. And it can be kind of terrifying for a parent because we see that the intimacy we crave is at risk. We're worried that they're going to bond to somebody else's way of life, which feels like invalidation of all the energy we've poured into our kids. When I think about this transition from raising little babies and toddlers into the younger sort of six, seven, eight years old stage, what I like to invite parents to do is really think about how to go down the rabbit trail of dissent. One of the values of parents seems to be cooperation. Every book I read is about how to get kids to cooperate. Right. <laughs> and so that's Just the highest wash goal your of adulting. Hands. Like, that's it, right? Yes. A small ask. It's Yes, if you could just <laughs> buckle yourself in the car seat and not get out right. when I'm driving, I would be such a happy mother. But the truth is, dissent is what creates the strongest bond. Because if you can be loved when you don't agree, mm -hmm. you have intimacy. If agreement is the foundation of your relationship, your intimacy is at risk every day of your life. Mm -hmm. Because the moment they think away from you, you're not close. So if you want closeness, allowing your kids to not think how you think is the key. And it'll start young. I love that you brought up hand washing. You know, you say to your six-year-old, go wash your hands, it's time for dinner. And your six-year-old says, I don't want How'd you. How do you know? <laughs> Julie, this is my house. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you so what's your parental move yeah. when a child doesn't want to wash their hands? Um, usually, oh man, what do I do? You know, at this point, I just feel like we do it because we do it, right? I don't ask too many questions and I'm kind of like, just do it. Like, let's just get it done. And because so much of parenting is autopilot. And this is one of those things, yes. especially with COVID, that I have put on autopilot, even though, okay, let's say I've put it on autopilot, but she has not. Um, she's not, she's still questioning the why to that. Yes. And a lot of parents, they they take two approaches. One the most common approach, I was totally guilty of this, by the way, is the parental propaganda program, right? You, you just repeat the slogans that you've heard your whole mm -hmm. life, which are, of course you wash your hands. You're going to eat dinner. Your hands are dirty. And then the child's like, they don't look dirty. And you're like, well, you can't see it. It's invisible. They're called germs and they live on your hands. And when you touch food, it goes on the food and then the food goes in your mouth and then you get sick. And your child's looking at you like, you're from another planet right. because didn't they just eat Cheerios off the floor like three yeah. hours ago and they're not sick? Uh, didn't they watch you pick up your baby's pacifier off the floor of Target, suck it in your own mouth, and then put it in your baby's mouth? They, they are suddenly aware that you're lying. Right. You, this is a belief you hold, but you have not even vetted your own belief. Yeah. It's just you heard this story about germs somewhere in your life, yeah. and now you believe it and you're passing on the propaganda. So that's the first way most yeah. of us do it. The second way is we spend a lot of energy teaching because we think we're answering the why. And that seems better, but in a weird way, what we're saying to our kids is, I know more than you, so anytime time you have a question, the way to find out the best answer is from somebody who knows more than you. Well, what happens when they're 13 and they're with a 16-year-old? Mm -hmm. That's the model. Well, the 16-year-old knows more. Mm -hmm. They're a little more experienced. But that isn't really what we're hoping will happen. Yeah. We're hoping at 13 with a 16-year-old, they're like, does this 16-year-old know? Yeah. How can I tell? So one of the things I recommend with the hand washing is go down the rabbit hole. You can't do this all the time. I know you're busy. Once a month will work. But just ask them, oh, you don't want to wash your hands. Tell me more about that. What's going on here? Is it water temperature? Child says, yes. You go get a thermometer and you start measuring what temperature they can tolerate. See if that helps them. And that research, that data collection is critical thinking. If that isn't enough, you can move on. Okay, what is it? Is it the water? Is it too long for your hands to dry? Should we try hand sanitizer? They don't like it. It's sticky. 
Well, what else kills germs? You might Google it and find out heat kills germs. So now, instead of washing their hands, you're just going to use a hot blow dryer on their hands for a little while. Or you might even just roll the dice and say, you know what? For a week, we're not going to wash like your hands. Let's see if you get sick. <laughs> I actually, to be perfectly honest, and I couldn't say this yes. openly in the past two years, but I don't really care about hand washing. And we don't even, okay, I don't know how much I should disclose here, but I don't really make my kids wash their hands much at home. Um, so it does feel like this is society held expectation that like we always wash our hands when we're out. We always wash our hands if, like you know, after going to the bathroom, but like, sure. But like, I just, in a bathroom I didn't or whatever, really notice right? until I went to visit a friend and we stayed at their house for a few days. And I noticed how much they, their kids wash their hands and how many times they're asking them. They're like, Oh wow, we don't really wash our hands that much. Um, and I feel pretty good about it. I mean, my kids are very, <laughs> very healthy considering. Um, but I do, I yeah. definitely like this, like you just wash your hands because you should, and maybe you won't get sick, but maybe you will. <laughs> It is. It's, you know, question our own beliefs. A hundred percent. And that's true sort of across the board, right? So one of the things I learned very early on um, through the unschooling movement, uh, which is a kind of homeschooling that is sort of curriculum free, they're using life and Google, right? That's kind of how they teach. And I remember one of the moms saying, when your child asks you a question and you have a habitual response, just take a moment to pause and ask yourself, why do I hold that belief? Mm -hmm. Why do I hold that strategy? Because so often you will get further if you just do a little research. So a child says, I hate brushing my teeth. We tend to just double down. But she said, do some research on toothbrushing, even while you're still enforcing toothbrushing. Just find out more about it. You may even still brush their teeth, but you also might not, or you might find out there's a better toothbrush. You might find out you only have to do it every other day. You might find out all kinds of things you don't currently know. But one of the mistakes we make is that we have this propaganda program mm -hmm. we've inherited and we have a school system that has decided that authorities tell us what's true rather than trusting us to evaluate truth from a variety of sources. And there are always more than one source for every idea that we're considering. Yeah. And what about the fear factor? Like I'm thinking about our dentist mm. told my kids that they get sugar bugs in their teeth and they, if they don't brush enough, they have to get the sugar bugs out. And like, I appreciate the humor and the lightness of it, but my kids really thought that they had bugs in their mouth and I had to tell them that that's a lie and it's not true. And it's hard to explain to kids, like, why would an adult lie to me? It's tricky, isn't it? And I understand that every child has a different capacity for going down this rabbit hole. So you want to be careful not to overwhelm your child with too much information or, or taking away the security of predictable patterns in your life. Sometimes they're just distracted, being little stinkers, whatever. You know, we know that about kids. They, they don't want to finish playing their game to get ready to eat dinner. So they just say they don't want to wash their hands, right? You are able to discern some of that. But if we're trying to raise critical thinkers, answering a question like, do bugs live in my teeth is important. Mm -hmm. And even you can contextualize it. You know what? This dentist has a lot of kids who are afraid of brushing their teeth and he wants to give them a meaningful way of understanding that it's important. Mm -hmm. So this is something he made up. And it sort of reminds me of the tooth fairy. Why do we have that? Like things that you can correlate that help them see a bigger picture. I remember I shared in my book, when I was six years old, I went to visit my little friend, Emily Shu. Her family was Chinese American. And I got to her house. And as I was about to go bounding in the house, her mother came to the door and told me I had to take off my shoes. It was the first time in my life I had ever been told to take off shoes in the house. I got in their house. They had white carpeting. This is like 1965, right? <laughs> white carpeting. And then they've got, you know, white couches with plastic and there's like no clutter. It was completely surprising space. Like I can still picture it. And at the time I just thought, oh, it's this strange thing these neighbors do. They didn't really assign any meaning to it. 20 years later, I'm living in North Africa and they all take their shoes off when you get to their house and they give you actually slippers mm -hmm. or sandals to put on. And literally I had this moment where I thought, oh, are, are Americans recklessly unsanitary about yeah. shoes and houses? 
So it's that kind of thing. It's giving your children a chance to kind of look at our natural assumptions mm -hmm. and really ask questions about them. Because taking your shoes off is a great idea in a house, and yet it's culturally not what we do. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's interesting to think about. I think about um, when raising critical thinkers, especially in the early years, I mean, up to the age, I don't know, 10, 12, that kids think in such black and white terms. Oh, true. that how do you know, how do we get them to see any gray? And at what age do you think that this gray really starts to be a little easier to access for most kids? I mean, maturity makes all the difference, right? So when they hit 10 to 12, they start hitting puberty. That capacity really grows. It accelerates in the teens. It's not really finished in terms of the brain development till 26. Um, but however, comma, you can introduce some of the key features of critical thinking while they're in the black and white stage and expand their understanding. So one of the classic ways we did it in our family, my um, kid's dad was a literature professor. And whenever we would watch a, a movie with our kids, he would get out the remote control. And right after the first opening scene, which like in Disney movies is always action packed, right? A parent always dies. <laughs> yeah, something, yes, yeah, something tragic always happens. And immediately you can find that you are rooting for a certain character. So he would pause and he'd say, okay, who are we rooting for? And you know, it was incredible how often they knew. Then we would ask, well, who are we rooting against? And they would know. And then we'd ask the follow-up question, well, how do you know to root for that one and not that one? And that's an interesting question mm -hmm. for a five-year-old yeah. or a seven-year-old, because they're going to say things you're not even noticing or thinking about. Mm -hmm. And they're also going to surface some stereotypes very quickly. Well, he's wearing a black hat. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. What What about that color? You know, you're watching a Western. Um, well, uh, the music got really loud and mean. Oh, yeah, the music did get loud and mean. Starting to surface what they notice, not draw conclusions. You know, who's telling this story? What would this story be like if someone else told it? I gave the example in my book of the three little pigs. So my oldest son, Noah, when he was like three, that was his absolute favorite. I told it every day on every walk we took. And one night in the bathtub, you know, he's just actually repeating and speaking along with me. So we headed to the library and I suddenly noticed this book by John Sheska called The True Story of the Three Little Pigs. And it's told from the wolf's perspective. Mm -hmm. And it's just a hilarious. I remember that actually. I have a vivid memory of my sixth grade teacher reading that book to us. We listen to fairy tales uncritically. They're told from an omniscient fairy tale storyteller, narrator person, and we just assume that the information we're receiving is how it happened. And then along comes John Sheska writing this book, and it's a tongue in cheek look at how the wolf could justify eating little pigs. But here's what's amazing. I was a full-grown adult reading this book, so I'm cracking up. My three-year-old just thought, oh, maybe here's the true story. <laughs> here's, here's what actually happened. Yeah. And I was asking my staff, many of whom are like your age, they're young women, and they're like, I remember that book being read. One of my staff members said, I thought it was the true story because the title said the true story. Mm -hmm. So I felt betrayed that all those years I had been told a lying story. This is that black and white thinking you're talking about. Yeah. But this is an opportunity actually to say, well, here's an interesting perspective. Why are we laughing? What about it makes it humorous? Why do we think it's true or not true? Then you could ask a follow-up question. Well, do you think the story would have been different if the first little pig told it? Do you think it'd be different if the brick house told it? You can start asking that question about other stories you're reading to your children, you know? How would the stepsisters tell the story of Cinderella? Very differently than Cinderella's perspective, right? So if we start allowing our kids to recognize that there are many ways to represent information and storytelling, we've already given them the first chink in the armor of that black and white thinking without expecting them to not be black and white. The goal isn't for them to be gray or anyone to be gray. It is to recognize that each person's viewpoint is as sacred to that person as is your own. That is the foundation of critical thinking. Mm.
How do you think parenting styles impact? Do you think that authoritarian mm. or because I said so dictator style parenting, what kind of implications do you think that has on critical thinking? Well, it trains kids to defer to the authority in the room. So whoever has the most voice, the loudest presence, the most um, well-articulated sense of authority, it teaches kids to look for that in every setting. So if they're in a corporate setting, if they're in a school setting, if they're in a religious setting. The authoritarian model, according to research, does not surface close relationships frequently with the adults in their lives when they become adults themselves. Because all of us want to be our own person. Uh, there's one guy whose work I really love. His name is Paul Tournier. He was a, a Swiss psychologist in the 1960s. And one of his books, The Adventure of Living, really pointed this out with some good research. They were showing in this book how religious communities often pass on their beliefs to their children, but their children almost always select a different expression of the same religious faith. Mm. So you might raise your child Orthodox Jew, they grow up and become a Reformed Jew. You might raise them Reformed, and they suddenly go kosher when they're adults. Um, and we see this in church selection. We see this across the board. And what they're saying is this, values passed down in a loving family tend to stay with children, but behaviors, choices, and actual beliefs are their own. Just as most of us do not hold the same identical views and style of being as our own parents today in the areas of money, sex, religion, education, and parenting, so too our children are going to differentiate and think away from us. Uh, the last chapter of my book is called The Courage to Change Your Mind because children change their minds. And so do we, right? Uh, we 100% do, but we're so comfortable with our own mind changes. We think we can just give our kids a shortcut and keep them from having to go through the learnings that we went through. Mm -hmm. I have a daughter who decided to be vegan when she was 15 or 16. And most of my peer group, other mothers like me, told me not to let her mm. because it would be inconvenient to me. Which it probably was, right? Oh, and expensive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I saw it the other way around. I thought this is an opportunity for, for a young person to align their behavior with their beliefs and see what that feels like. What cost is there to saying I believe something and actually doing it? Mm. So that's the kind of thing we want to support in our kids. Yeah. And authoritarian parents don't typically want to support that. Yeah, they don't make that space for it mm -mm. as much. There, there's a chapter in your book entitled Overwhelm That Overturns. And in it, mm. you say, an encounter flips you out of your comfort zone directly into your unknowing, your lack of skill and the awareness that what you knew prior to the moment in time is not enough to save you, where experience centers you. Can you tell me a little bit more about that, the difference between an encounter and an experience? Well, let's, can we back up to reading for a moment? Because yeah. I think this is helpful. So a lot of us get our information and our education through books that we've sort of missed the point of reading. Reading gives us a lot of information efficiently, but it does not deepen our personal experience of what we're learning. So a lot of times you can feel like you've mastered the information but actually, upon the experience, you recognize there's all kinds of stuff you don't really know yet. A good example I use in the book is the violin. So you could read every possible thing about the violin, but if you've never heard one played, is that enough? So an experience of violin might be going to a symphony, or perhaps you have a friend in Kentucky and they take you to hear a bluegrass fiddle playing, and you're like, wow, two very different experiences of the violin. That really makes my reading a lot more well-informed. Experiences are under your control. You can go to a place like a symphony and sit in the chair and watch skilled musicians play. And you can even have opinions like, well, that one's good, that one's bad. But there's nothing of you at stake. A little bit more is at stake than when you were reading, but truly not much about you is at stake. An encounter is when someone puts that violin in your hands and you don't know how to play one. Now, your current set of resources are not enough to match the challenge of this uh, violin encounter. 
we see this all the time in human beings. So you could read about a foreign country like Morocco. You could go on a tour and that would be an experience of Morocco that you learn a lot more about just by traveling on the tour bus and seeing it. An encounter is moving there, learning the language, mastering the foods, uh, becoming a member of the community. Encounter flips you out of your comfort zone. So when we're raising kids to think well, we want to provide reading, experiences, and encounters, and then to train them to recognize that if they haven't had all three, their opinions should always be reserved with some humility. Mm -hmm. So you can say, well, here's what I think about violins, but having never played one. Mm -hmm. Here's what I think about the Middle East, but having never gone there. There's a little reticence to be quite so black and white. And this is something we can really offer our kids, which would radically change the landscape of conversations if everybody were to participate that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. I love that, you know, that you really need to have those three things in order to really be able to have, not in, not in order to be able to have an opinion, but to be able to have a full, well-rounded viewpoint. Yeah. Circling back to my dad for a moment, I remember him kind of giving me a little grief about the uh, news channels that he thinks I listen to. And I said, well, don't really get my information from the news. And he said, well, where do you get it from? I said, from people. Like if I want to understand the impact of a political policy, talk to people whom it will impact the most. And if you can't, it's hard to really render a verdict. Uh, I cite some research in my book um, of this one policy that was being proposed in the state of Oregon in the early 1990s. They had the opportunity to provide medical services to a widespread class of people, but they were trying to decide if they should offer those services to people who were disabled as well as able-bodied people. So they did a survey of able-bodied people and the able-bodied people as a group said, I'd rather be dead than blind, or I'd rather be dead than in a wheelchair. And so they made the decision not to put those services in place because they assumed that disabled people didn't have lives worth living. Mm -hmm. And of course, by then the ADA, American Disabilities Act had been passed. And so it was taken to court and overturned and those services were made available. But in follow-up studies done by you know um, academics, what they discovered is that when you do not have a direct experience or encounter of the scale we're talking about, you will use your limited experience and project that onto the other person and think that that is accurate to how they're experiencing. So an able-bodied person was thinking, well, if I were in a wheelchair, I would feel unhappy. Even though statistics show that the suicide rate is far lower for disabled than able-bodied mm -hmm. people. Interesting. Yeah. So that's kind of... Uh, that whole notion put forth by Iris Marion Young is called asymmetrical reciprocity. It is the capacity to recognize that I can never fully know another's experience if I've never had it. So for instance, I can never know what it feels like to be black. I can only be a witness to what is told to me. Yeah. I think about um, how we've all been home so much for the past two years. And I mean, my kids, I feel like most of their memories now are home and COVID. And, um, and I think about the places that make me feel small and in comparison mm. to the world and the two places that come to mind are nature and in a library. Whew. And those places are places that a lot of kids are not really experiencing these days. And it's really easy to feel big and powerful when you're holding a phone, typing away in your hand. Um, and even when I'm acquiring knowledge via my phone and I'm reading an article, I have a different feeling than when I'm in a library surrounded by towers of books and just really kind of intimidated in a good way about how little I know and how much there is unknown. Gosh, I, thank you for that gift. I, I love that image. I love that image. My son, Jacob, uh, was, um, homeschooled till 10th grade and then he went to public high school and uh, at the time that he started high school, he was a little bit 
irritated with me because he didn't start in ninth grade and he really wanted to be like valedictorian and um but it was he wouldn't have grades from ninth grade so he was kind of annoyed and i had said to him at the time i understand that homeschooling now sounds like a choice you wish i hadn't made for you and i can imagine how powerless you feel about that and i'm sorry if it limits you in any way i i don't think it will but if it does i'm here to hold space for your pain and you know the whole nine yards and then I said, um, after we had a long conversation about it, I said, you know, I know you don't understand now, but I hope there's a day where you look back and you're able to see why I made the decision. So two years later, he was a senior in high school and he was assigned to write a paper on William Faulkner. And his father had written his master's thesis on Faulkner and was a university professor. So he gave Jacob his library card and Jacob went down to the university into the stacks to check out books. And when he got home, he said this to me. He said, Mom, I now know why you homeschooled me. And I said, really? Uh, why? He said, I was on the floor in between the stacks with books all over the floor surrounding me. And all I could think was how much I wanted to read all of them and write a really great paper, but it was only due in three days mm -hmm. and I wouldn't have time. He said, "That's you wanted me to have time to read as many books as I needed to write a paper. I'm like, that's right. But here's why I'm sharing that story now. When you said that about the stacks, I had not connected till this moment that that's what that did to him. He was in an environment with those towers of books, and he suddenly saw what learning could actually be. Yeah. It was this immersion in all these perspectives, and it was an endless immersion. But you're right, on a phone... You've got three articles showing on your Twitter. You feel knowledgeable because you read all three, and you're not even aware of the volumes of academic work that might even pertain to this topic. It kind of it feels a little bit like this loss of the sense of of money, right? Like when you're not holding it, and you oh. don't know how much there is, and not, don't not having that tangible element, which I think is going to impact our kids in some way. I mean, I, we'll figure it out, but the, there's going to be an impact. A hundred percent. And I liked what you said about nature. One of the problems of this insulated internet life we have with small children is that it feels safer to give them an iPad or to give them the computer because we can supervise them and we know where they are and we can kind of follow their history. So taking advantage of letting them play in a muddy creek without your eye on them every second giving them the opportunity to have those tactile sensations. If you want your child off of a computer, I, I used to joke about this. You might not like this on your podcast, but I'm going to say it anyway. I say, you know, give your 12-year-old a book of matches and tell them to start a bonfire. Like, they'll get off the computer for that. Yeah. Give them something worthy of getting off the computer for. Using your sewing machine, climbing a tree and hammering boards to make their own sort of makeshift treehouse. Give them something worthy that uses their entire bodies and minds. Yeah. Don't just ask them to get off and be passive and quiet with Duplos in the corner of your living room. Yeah. Yeah, I agree so much on that. And I think that some kids easily kind of shift from one thing to the next and they come up with ideas of things to do, but it takes, some kids need more prompting. They need more yes. help getting started. Yeah. And you know, when I was raising kids, we really got into bird watching. We had lived in California where there were like three birds. And then we moved to Ohio where there were dozens. And we hung the feeder in our yard and I put a box with a binocular and we had, you know, the field guides and then the poster and they got to contribute to the birding log. And then we contributed all this information to the Cornell lab for ornithology. They won't do it alone though. Mm -hmm. They need you. Yeah, They need you to care. They need you to approve. Mm -hmm. They want your admiration. It should not just be a way to distract them from the things they love. They need us to get curious with them. That's right. Um, yeah. re recently on the podcast, we've been talking about this idea of regulating adult screen time and giving up. You know, my family, we've been doing screen-free weekends where the adults nice. and kids are all screen-free together. And it's just been this incredible experience, mostly for the grownups, um, to be forced to do other things, to be forced to look out the window and observe the bird out there. Um, and I, we, we do, have, we do a little bit of bird watching. And I remember when I first started bird watching and I was just like, well, before this, I mean, I was 30, I don't know, like 34 when this, when I started this, 
I just knew cardinals and then brown birds. Like that was the extent right. of my bird watching. But now I know like 15 different birds and I see so much more because I know a little yes. bit, just like a tiny bit, not a lot, but a little bit. Charlotte Mason, who's a popular um, uh, educator whose theories are really prominent in homeschooling, she used to say that you increase intimacy the more you can name the natural world around you. Mm. So she had this belief that you should learn trees by their barks in winter so that you would know them year round. She believed in nature journaling, sitting on a you know boulder and drawing everything in your space and being able to label it accurately. Interestingly, when I was in this wild, you know, um, public school experience. I had a science teacher in seventh grade. Uh, my junior high was in Malibu Canyon in uh, Malibu, California. And she took our class. You couldn't even do this anymore. She took our class to a creek that was out in the canyon. So we had to walk to it from the classroom. And then we all got to sit in our own space where we couldn't see each other. And then we would draw that space and she would do it over a month. So you went every day for a month. Like that was our school. And then she gave us field guides to be able to identify everything we saw from dragonflies to water spiders to um, the cattails to the nettles. And it was such a rich experience learning to sit, first of all, for mm -hmm. 40 minutes and just observe the same space every single day for a month. I feel like that is missing, uh, but we have to be deliberate about it now. Also with reading, I talk about that in the book, this deep reading that this generation is not experiencing because of the scroll. So deliberately turning our phones off and putting them where our brains can't see them. Um, I remember on the Ezra Klein podcast, he had this guest, Nicholas Carr, who wrote a book called The Shallows, which I used in my research for my book. And they talked about how powerful even a phone turned off is if you can see it. Mm -hmm. And Ezra Klein said he literally had to buy a safe. I have had one. A timer yeah. on it oh yeah. For his phone. It's amazing. So he knew he could not open it. You have yeah. one? Oh yeah. We, ha we have one for the remotes too. <laughs> oh my gosh. So tell me about that experience. Cause I've never done that. Well, it's true. You know, this out of sight, out of mind, um, is it's very true. And I found that for myself that when I didn't have the phone visible to me, it, it wasn't occupying brain space because even when I wasn't on it, it was still occupying brain space for me. I was thinking about it. I was wondering about it. I was wondering, do I have DMs on Instagram? You know, so that just disappeared. And this, all this brain space came back where I'm not wondering because wow. it's not even a possibility. So, um, yeah, it's been really yeah. awesome. So that's what they show in the research is that it is this brain drain because it is plugging us into um, a hyper focus attention state from our primal ancestors. Mm -hmm. So what we're actually doing with the pings and the dings and the red dots, it's like the downtick of temperature or the grunt of a warthog for our primal brains. We feel like we have to be on alert. Yeah. And the only way to get away from that is to actually hide those things so that you feel safe without them. There is no tendency to be interrupted. For me, a good comparison is like the difference between the bag of Lay's potato chips being on the counter versus in the cabinet. Yeah, It's on the counter. Even if I'm not eating it, there's a certain amount of my energy going to, God, that sounds really it. yummy right now. I really <laughs> want a handful of those. The second I put on the clip and put it in the cupboard, it's like my brain can relax. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's in its right place. It's not tempting me. It's also not asking me to put it away. And I think that's what's going on yeah. with the phones. Well, I think the safe adds this next level. It's like sealing the bag of potato chips or like yes. having it sealed. Because if I have a bag of potato chips that's sealed, I'll leave it alone. But the minute it's open, even in my cupboard, I, <laughs> I'm thinking about it. But you're right. It is. It's kind of like this progressive, like out of sight. Yeah. Good. Like closed and inaccessible, even better. And I, I think we all have different, different ability to regulate and to moderate. Um, yes. And I need a little more support in that than some do. Probably. Well, here's, here's the thing. I went into writing this book. I'm a huge technological optimist, especially in my space. I'm constantly advocating for television and movies and online gaming because there's so many great benefits from all of them. And I also don't believe in shame and blame as mm -hmm. adequate methods of control for anyone and nobody will do it. So I always try to see, okay, technology is creating good and a problem. 
technology will also solve the problem. This is how I think. Mm. So I went into writing this book, really wanting to champion the cause. And then I came across all this research. And I was like, dang, I have to pay attention to this. I've got to change my thinking in light of mm. what I'm learning. And so what I've had to do, very similar to you, but now I think I'm going to buy the safe. But here's what I'm realizing. We just have to invent new solutions. And this timer safe mm -hmm. sounds so extreme. And yet it is a solution because we really want our bodies and our minds to remember what it's like to have deep focus. Yeah. Deep focus allows for so many amazing benefits. And one of the key ones, as we're talking about critical thinking, is the capacity to think private thoughts, mm. to just think thoughts, mm. to not have to render a thumbs up or a thumbs down yeah. or show your solidarity or show your antinomy. Like you get to just show up and let the thought be there alongside your thoughts, riding sidecar. Yeah. You don't have to render a verdict. Let the thoughts do their work. Yeah. I just interviewed Ethan Cross, who is the author of Chatter. And he brought up this idea that, which I never noticed, but when you log on to Facebook, what it says is, what's on your mind, Danae? It's this invitation to share your private thought. Exactly. And wow, just like seeing every time I see that sentence now, I look at it differently, right? This really wow. needing to conscientiously be like, Danae, you have private thoughts and public thoughts and they're different. And just because you have that invitation on Facebook does not mean you should share all those private thoughts. That's right. And the like and dislike button, mm -hmm. if you're a person like me, a person of conscience, sometimes you just feel like you're not in your integrity to not support a good comment yeah. or put a thumbs down on a bad one. But why? We're not required. Uh, it, it matters to grow in your thinking more than to simply validate thinking you've already achieved. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think it's so important to remember that. Your alignment with what you already think doesn't indicate anything about you. It, that's not a growth opportunity. That's just a validation. And, and there are times, you know, protest marches or whatever, where you are showing solidarity with your beliefs. But Facebook is not a protest rally. You do not have to. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this chat today, Julie. Where can we find your book and you online? Thank you so much. Uh, I am on Instagram and Twitter, Twitter at Brave Writer, Instagram at Julie Brave Writer. Uh, and my company is BraveWriter.com. So please feel free to take a look there. Raising Critical Thinkers is anywhere you buy books. I have a free book club guide that you can download from RaisingCriticalThinkers.com. That's my book website. And that's for those of you who'd like to get in conversation with friends while you're reading the ideas in the book. Oh, I love it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great conversation. I hope you enjoyed this chat with Julie. If you want to get in touch with her or the links to the things that we talked about today, go to simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 313. And please pause and take a moment and leave a rating or review for this show. I greatly appreciate your support. Thanks for tuning in and have a good one.